All right, so um, I'm very happy to introduce today, we have Lisa Scott, and I'm sure many people may be familiar with Lisa. Uh, maybe you've heard her be, being called the weed lady from uh, years back, but she is very familiar with invasive species. She's the executive director with um, OASIS, which is the Okanagan Similkameen Invasive, oh, I have to look, Invasive Species Society. I almost had it, I was almost there, I should have just went with it. And um, she's going to talk to us about invasive species and things that we should keep in mind uh, in, as the spring comes around, because I think things are starting to get more active, right? They are. All right. So without further ado, take it over, Lisa. Thank you very much, Chandra. Um, thanks, everyone, for coming today. Just, can I, everyone at the back hear me well? Excellent. Great. Um, so who's heard me speak before? Okay, at least my dad has to put his hand up. <laughs> He's heard me. Oh, lots of new people. That's excellent. I know a few shy people. I know you've heard me speak. But anyway, I've been doing this for 28 years now, so I'm starting to feel old, even with this new Taylor Swift setup that Chandra's got for me. Um, but thank you for coming out today. Um, I was preparing... My talk yesterday, I am a procrastinator, so yes, I was, but I have so many from 28 years, but, and I went, I want to do something a little different, so you're my lucky, you're my, you're my lucky audience to see my different approach. Um, invasive species are a big thing, they really are, and I'm, if you take away anything from over this next hour, I hope it's that you understand this is a big issue. There is a crisis, it's global, but we can do something local. And we all need to do it collectively. We all have a role to play. And that's a really important message I, I want to impart on you. So, first thing I'm going to do is stop talking. Whoops, <laughs> stop talking. And I'm going to put a question out to all of you. This is, this is my first time doing this. So what do invasive species mean to you? And I mean, I won't make you put your hand up, just if anyone wants to call out, what does it mean to you? It, mean, it means tourists or it... <laughs> well, I tell you what, if we, if, we get, if we get certain invasive species, we'll lose tourists and you might go, yay, but you know what? That's not good for our local economy. We are tourism based in the Okanagan. What else? From the heart. Yes. So she said something I have to keep pulling. So obviously she's thinking of plants. What else? When we think, what do invasive species mean to you? Flat tires. Flat tires. Somebody's encountered puncture vine. Destruction of another species. Destruction of another species. Yes. So does it pull at your heartstrings already? So for me, invasive species meant a career. It meant job security. And while that sounds terrible, um, that's what it meant to me and still does. 28 years I've been doing this. And I've been very fortunate that I've been able to bring my children out with me and was able to have children and home-based office. And there's my daughter that was... That was over, that was 20 years ago. She was um, releasing insect enemies with me and I just sent this to her and she remembers. So being outdoors, that's what it meant to me. Spending time with my kids. It also has meant interacting with lots of people, meeting so many new people. And again, this is an old photo, um, but sharing my knowledge with people. And the funny thing about this, this is a fellow who used to be my elementary school teacher in Okanagan Falls, and there I was teaching him about invasive plants. It also means to me about the ability to partner with so many different organizations, um, collaborate, and then meet some pretty interesting ambassadors. This is Kilo. Um, this is British Columbia's first muscle-sniffing dog. We have two now. So that's what invasive species has meant to me. But it also means a lot of negative things. And this is where and why I called the title of my presentation today Biodiversity Under Siege, because we live in this amazing place called the Okanagan Valley. 
And the Okanagan Smelkameen region is just full of so many wildlife species, so many plant species. We're a hot spot for biodiversity in Canada. We're recognized for this. Um, but we're also at risk for invasive species, a lot of them. And so you look at a place like here in our South Okanagan wetlands, um, these low uh, or valley bottom wetlands support a lot of wildlife species, including species at risk, such as the spadefoot, and the tiger salamander, but they're also at risk of this guy. This is American bullfrog, hey? It's from the eastern United States. It is not supposed to be here. And it has been here, it's been eradicated, but it could move back in here. And that presents a risk to those other amphibians that I just showed you, because it eats them. It eats anything that it can fit in its mouth. And then we have beautiful ponderosa pine forests, another ecosystem that has been impacted by us. And it's at risk to invasive plants. This is also a ponderosa pine ecosystem. That is sulfur sankofoil, a monoculture. So as a reminder, this is what we're gonna be seeing in just a few short weeks, that big punch of color, beautiful, biodiverse ecosystem with all the different colors, the wildflowers, the bunch grasses, the shrubs, change to this, an invasive plant that completely takes over, forms a monoculture, and in fact, this particular plant changes the soil chemistry and inhibits the growth of other plants. So you walk through here, and you're hard pressed to find anything else growing other than this one invasive plant. So not only is it, is it changing our ecosystems and the species that are dependent on them, there's also cultural impacts. On the left-hand side here, you'll see bitterroot or speetlum. This has huge cultural importance to our First Nations. Um, you know, and I should have said at the start, I, you know, I'm, I'm proud to work, live, and play on the traditional unceded territory of the Silk people. And I work with I work with members of the local bands and I learn and I, you know, you see a situation like this where you have the bitter root, high cultural value, and then right next to it, this is sulfur sankofoil. And that's just going to continue to spread and take over important habitats for medicinal plants, important harvesting plants, and what have you. And of course, we have a very strong agricultural sector in our valley as well. We're, it's so bountiful in the summer. It's amazing what we get from our, this region for tree fruits, grape growing leading to wine production, um, all the ground crops. But that's at risk as well from species such as this. That's an insect in there. It's a whole bunch of them all in here. It's a plant hopper called spotted lanternfly. It's not here yet, but you know a lot of specialists think it's only a matter of time before it gets here. And it's got a pathway following an invasive tree called tree of heaven, which we have no shortage of, and it's a preferred host species. And last but not least, in the news quite a bit, um, you know we have our beautiful waterways and our lake shores but they're at risk from something else yet again. Invasive mussels. Again, probably only a matter of time before this invasive mollusk makes its way into British Columbia and our beautiful uh, lakes and waterways will be ruined forever. Just a couple quotes I wanted to share with you here. Um, relatively recent, uh, well, uh, back in 2019, um, an intergovernmental platform for biodiversity and ecosystem services, um, they, they've produced multiple reports over the years on invasive species. In 2019, they identified invasive species as one of the five most important direct drivers of biodiversity loss. And then more recently, just last fall, there was another fairly extensive report they produced and in that they stated that invasive species have played a key role 
in 60% of plant and animal extinctions globally. Um, added to this, of course, we know that climate change is only going to exacerbate the issue. This is a big deal. All right, so what's happening? What are we doing about, about it? And I'm gonna wrap up with what you can do about it. Because as I said at the start, it's going to take us all to work collectively for the solutions. Um, so as I mentioned at the start, I've been at this for 28 years and that's how long, or how, yeah, how long Oasis has been in place. We've gone through a few different name changes. We started out as an invasive species society and at the time we were one of the few, if you looked at a map of British Columbia, we were one of the few um, coordinated groups who were actively doing something about invasive species in this province. But this is, this is a much more recent map, and everywhere you see a number, there is an organization, whether it's a society or a charity, or it might be a regional district, they are stepping up. They are doing something about invasive plants, or they might be an invasive species society like us. Um, and there's a website there, if you're interested to learn more, there's an interactive website where, where you can look right across British Columbia and see who's, who's doing what where. So this is a huge and very positive shift forward in our province. So maybe stepping back a bit, if you're not too sure what are invasive species, well, they're not native to British Columbia. They're not indigenous to here. They did not evolve here with our native plants and animals. They came here accidentally or purposefully, but regardless, most of them are lacking their natural predators, the insects, the disease, the pathogens that keeps them in check in their native homeland. Because they're lacking those natural enemies and because they have certain characteristics that make them more aggressive. And as we say to the kids, they're like bullies. They just take over the space, the light, the nutrients, the food, and so on. They're competitive. So they take over the habitat. They take over the food. They dominate the area. And this causes detrimental impacts um, to natural ecosystems, to managed ecosystems. It costs us dearly economically environmentally and socially. Specific to invasive plants, they tend to be um, very rapid in their growth habits. Often they spread by seed and also spread vegetatively, like by their root systems or by suckering. Um, they tend, tend to produce high numbers of seeds and be really good at dispersing those seeds. They might be pokey or um, they might have some other means like tumbleweeds, so tumbling in the wind. Well, those plants are spreading their seeds when they do that. It's a really unique adaptation. And then the, the consistent thing with invasive plants is this, um, they do so much better when the soils are disturbed. So this is a really key thing that we focus in on when it comes to taking action is, the more we can reduce our soil disturbances or when we do put in that new patio or that new septic field or that new fence line, plant it, seed it. You've got disturbed soils, replace it. Don't leave a niche for invasive plants to grow. Because we know that invasive species know no boundaries. So it starts on one property, it just moves to the other. Then it becomes a neighborhood problem, a community problem. Invasive species freely travel our waterways, our roadways. They don't care whose land it is. So again, just speaks to the need for everybody to work collaboratively, collectively, pool our resources, our time, our energies. And once they uh, arrive to British Columbia, how do they move? So this is about pathways and vectors of spread. So through industry, through urban development. Um, transportation and utility corridors are a big way of moving. Um, through recreation, wildlife, livestock, us, our pets, they're all forms of spread or potential pathways of spread. As well, the horticultural industry, and of course it's that time of year, you know, myself included, um, 
we're all excited to get out in the garden and start growing the latest and greatest plant or bringing in a new house plant into our um, home, but we got to think carefully when it comes to new plants that are rapid growers, rapid spreaders, self-seeding, because guess what? They start on your property and then they're on the neighbors and so on. And I was just speaking to someone at the start, we're really lacking the legislation in this province to effectively deal with invasive species. So for now, the onus is on us to be really be aware. Um, travel and trade is another big one. Um, you know, especially when we go overseas in the winter time, if you're going hiking somewhere, or even within BC, you know, keeping your boots clean and thinking about what you might be bringing back. So if I haven't imparted this message on you yet, hopefully this drills at home. So why should we care? Because invasive species impact everyone. Every single person in this room is impacted some way. But the great part about this is everybody can do something about it. And again, why? Because once these beautiful grasslands and forests and wetlands and agricultural areas that we depend on for our food supply, once they become infested, our natural areas, sometimes they can never be restored. So we always say prevention is the key. Prevention is the number one thing we want to do. Um, we want to keep these invasive species out because once they arrive, sometimes it's impossible to turn the clock back eradicate and get them, um, move them out of the area. All right, the next few slides, I'm just going to go through some species that you might be familiar with. Shandra, do I need to stand somewhere? Oh, there, that's better. I need to get away from the speaker, I think. <laughs> um, so, and feel free to, um, you know, ask a question as we go through. I don't, I don't mind that, especially if it's about a specific species. So, um, pretty soon in the media, we're going to start talking about this one. This is myrtle spurge or donkey tail. Um, we usually write articles about it and people are talking about it, uh, usually April, May. Um, unfortunately, last year, this particular invasive plant um, it, it used to be sold years ago for rock gardens, when people start building rock gardens. It's a beautiful um, succulent type plant that requires little to no tending, little to no water, and it was just great, except that it's invasive. And we've been educating people over the years about it to the point where um, last year I had three phone calls in 24 hours to tell me that it was being sold at some of the pop-up gardens. And so I went and ended up speaking to them and they pulled them off the shelves. And then one of them slipped them back until I went back again. And then they pulled them off for good the second time. Um, this is where I say, and there's nothing to stop those individuals from selling them. Nothing. There is no law banning the sale of invasive plants. We have one of the oldest pieces of legislation in British Columbia called the Weed Control Act. I mean, it's still called weed. We've been saying invasive species or invasive plants for a very long time. Very old, very archaic. It's got an old list in the regulations. It needs to be upgraded, modified, and there is talk of Invasive Species Act for BC, but I'll probably be, you know, a great grandma by the time that happens. So right now the onus is on us collectively to be aware of our purchases. This is not a plant you want in your garden, and none of the ones I'm going to show you, but most you wouldn't want, but this one, you know, it's kind of cool looking, and, and at a time of water conservation, we're looking for plants that require minimal water. This is not a species you want, this donkey tail or myrtle spurge. This is a close relative. Um, this is called cypress spurge. I, I haven't seen it for sale for a very long time, but just beware the spurges. All of them, when you break a leaf, a stem, it's got a milky latex juice inside, and if that gets on your skin, it can cause a rash. If it gets in your eyes, it can cause blindness. Um, and not only that, you think it looks great in the one spot you plant it, well in a couple of years it is your entire garden. 
it, it spreads by explosive seed pods and it shoots its seed out. So this is definitely, then, then you're just spending years and years on your hands and knees digging it out. Not, not something anyone wants to do. So the spurges, you definitely want to stay away from. Um, rush skeleton weed, this is an interesting one. Um, it just showed up about, um, about 10 years ago was the first time we saw it in our region. It was one of these ones we knew would eventually get here because it's in Vernon, um, quite a bit of it. It's also in the, in the United States, in Washington State. And sure enough, it showed up on Highway 97, just side of, outside of Okanagan Falls, and that's where this particular picture was taken. This plant can get quite tall, a meter or more, and it has these tiny little yellow flowers, but otherwise it looks like a skeleton. Its leaves are tiny, um, except for the bottom leaves. But what does that actually look like to you, those bottom leaves? Does it look familiar? Looks so much like dandelion. So, um, yeah, so don't go back home and look in your yard and think it's filled with rush skeleton weed. It's probably dandelions, um, which I'm not concerned about. I always get asked, but I'm not concerned about dandelions. But rush skeleton weed, yes. And then the key thing is once it starts to grow and it gets this stalk, it has these very dark downward pointing hairs. And then it grows, obviously, as you can see, very tall and has this windborne seed. Now, we found another big patch just a few years ago right in Penticton off Westminster Avenue, and it's a big, big patch. And I was, it's just in the oddest place. I had driven past it year after year and, and missed it. And then I started paying attention to what happened on this side street. It's where the transport trucks park. The transport trucks that have come from Washington, from Idaho, that are traveling through and they park there and guess what they're transporting that they don't realize invasive plant seeds in the undercarriage in the tires and since then we've found um, a CFI regulated so Canada Food and Inspection Agency has a, a list of uh, high priority plants that, that a lot of them that don't occur in in Canada are very little and have potentially a really big threat um, to a particular crop or something. There's another species that showed up there called jointed goat grass, which is federally regulated. And again, I'm 100% certain it's those transport trucks that have unknowingly dropped it there. So we're working on eradicating this plant from our region, and rarely will you hear me use that E word. Um, but it's really important we try to do that when populations are small, when we don't have many plants and when we know it poses a big threat. And here's what it can do. This is in Vernon. As I mentioned, it's bad up there. This is a, a crop field up there. And uh, this, all these green in the foreground and then these green patches in the background, that's it's going to make harvesting very challenging there. It's got a really wiry stem. It gets bound up on the harvesting machine. Um, and it's it, because it's windborne seed. And then it's hard to see because when everything's green and then it's, it looks noticeable now. But that's a challenging plant to control. And this is Cal Lake Park, um, beautiful provincial park. But here it is along the trail. And then there's, there's so many patches there very, very difficult to control. It's got a root that goes down a couple of meters deep. This is not a plant you're just going to clip or hand pull. Um, it is a perennial. Yeah, it's a long-lived perennial plant with very deep root system. So, yeah, we want to, we don't want to get like this. Um, most of the invasive, the question was where has um, this come from? Most of the invasive plants have come from Europe, Asia, sometimes North Africa. And as I mentioned earlier, they got introduced here either accidentally, um, perhaps like in the case of um, some plants, they were a contaminant of crop seed. But in some cases, they were planted here because maybe they were a crop at some point in time, or they're a very attractive plant and they got sold in the horticultural industry. So a lot of different reasons for how they got here. Okay, 
tires. I know a few of you already know about this because somebody mentioned popped tires and they definitely pop bite tires. This is puncture vine. I'm pretty sure we have uh, a sample of the seed pod at our desk up here. You can come see later, but there it is in my hand. You can see these tiny little leaflets. That's a leaf in each. Each of these is a leaflet, very small, and this is why it's called puncture vine, very aptly named because of the fruit, which is this uh, hard, hard um, five-segmented fruit. It gets green at first, then it turns brown. Um, that breaks apart, like what you see in the upper right here, and every little piece uh, has seeds inside, up to four seeds, but they've got two spines. It gets called goat head down in the States because the two pointy spines. Um, so goat head and puncture vine are the same thing if you've heard that term before. But you know, this is a summer annual. So when you're, you know, it's summertime and you're hosting company or you're at the beach with your grandkids or and you're not, who wants to think about invasive plants? Well, that's when this plant is having a wonderful time. It's not growing yet. It's usually in, starts in June when the soil temperatures heat up and then it just thrives in the summertime. It's from Mediterranean areas. It loves the heat here. It loves it when there's no rain and then we get a little bit of rain in July or August and boom, it just explodes. And this is what it can do. So there in the center, you can see it's um, the seed pods just embed in, in uh, bite tires and they can pop that the tube. They can get embedded in um, vehicle tires, not pop them, of course, but that's how they get transported. It's that very effective means of getting dispersed from A to B. Um, on the left, this is in Asuyas many years ago. They they um, did this lovely new um, walkway, um, pedestrian walkway, but they left for some reason this area of gravel. And I mean, puncture vine's not a great competitor. It just took complete advantage of that place to move in and then now creeping onto the sidewalk, then people and pets are gonna pick it up and then it hits the roadway and now vehicles. So you can see why it spreads so quickly. And then on the far right, um, that's the, um, perimeter area of a, um, a vineyard. And sad to say, but pretty much every vineyard, at least from OK Falls South, has some level of puncture vine growing there. It just loves those soils where they've been cleared, the grapes have been planted, and then it starts growing around the perimeter of the vineyard, and then the tractors pick it up as they, and the people as they go between the rows and it's a real, real problem in our vineyard. So we're v working very closely with the viticultural industry on this particular plant, and of course the biking industry too. So recreation is, is one of our target audiences. Hound's tongue, um, if you've been involved with ranching, which I know some of you in the audience have been, um, this is definitely um, the bane of the ranching industry. You can see that poor cow there covered with the seeds. They're very sticky, we hitchhiker seeds. Um, this is a plant that's been around for quite a long time. Um, it's kind of doesn't, does, it looks relatively harmless, but everywhere there's one of those um, kind of violet, reddish colored, pretty flowers, you get four seeds or nutlets and the teardrop shape and they stick to everything very easily transported from one place to another and it becomes quite a problem for our livestock industry um, not just cows but horses and other animals um, pets pick it up really easily and we tend to just see it on our clothes and then we just pick it off and throw it down but if you picked it up you know kilometer back on your walk, you've now just, you're a vector now and you've just potentially started, you've just seeding a new plant. So just think about those sorts of actions when you're out enjoying the beauty of our, our biodiverse ecosystems. Toad flax, Dalmatian toad flax, another really common species we have. Um, fortunately, we've got a great natural insect enemy that we've released here. That's what my daughter was releasing on that very first slide that I showed you. Um, and areas like this, and if Shander brings me back next year, every year I say, I'm gonna take a picture. I know exactly where that is on Oliver Ranch Road, outside of OK Falls. It is 
there's no more toad flax. Like this insect has done an amazing job. So we're very thankful for it. Um, but this is again a plant that got introduced through the horticultural industry. It's very attractive snapdragon type plant. Uh, not sold anymore, but uh, unbelievable. Some people, every once in a while, still tell me, oh, I just dug this up from the roadside and planted it in my garden. It's so pretty. So don't do that. Don't pick up things. Don't dig things up and take them home. That's a big no-no, unless it's from your friend's garden. <laughs> Napweed, everybody knows this, and, and I have to laugh. I, I was born in Summerland and grew up here, and... Um, there's so many times I would go in, you know, be in a friend's house and they've got those classic family portrait on the wall, had the professional photographer go out to a nearby grassland or Munson Mountain and they're surrounded by knapweed. And I think everybody just assumes it's supposed to be here, but it's not. But it's been in the interior since the 1930s. It's been a long time. We're coming up to 100 years. So it's this really, this is diffuse knapweed. We've got a few different species. This is the most common. This is the one that breaks at the base, tumbles in the wind. It's prickly. It'll scratch your legs. If you pull it, you might get a rash on your forearms. Um, fortunately, Oh, and I'll just talk about spotted knapweed, kind of a, a close relative. This gets up into a little bit moister sites, higher elevation. You'll see this up Anarchist Mountain, heading into Boundary. Um, you'll see it up at Chute Lake, um, higher areas up above Naramata. It's It does not break at the base and tumble in the wind. Um, you get some really thick patches, like you see on the right there. That's up Anarchist Mountain. And it tends to have a purple flower, where, whereas the diffuse tends to have um, a white flower. Just fields and fields, unfortunately. Um, but we've got some great natural insect enemies again. Biocontrol is a fantastic means of reducing the spread of some of these plants. We don't have it for all species, but where we do, this is a tool that we actively promote and we help to distribute these insects. So there's um, root feeders here, and that's what they turn into. You see them in the summertime, they're very big. They're my favorites. Um, and then there's these little guys which um, can feed on all the green part. You can see this has actually killed it in this case. Um, they feed on the stem and the leaves, um, and then um, they will hollow, they'll lay an egg in the seed head, and actually the, as the egg turns into a larva, turns into a pupa, it hollows out and eats all the developing seeds, and you end up with a hollow seed head. So it's damaging the plant at different parts of the plant, which really has had this wonderful impact. So we see, we definitely have seen in my career, see a lot less toad flax, a lot less knapweed out on the landscape. And I have to say it's in large part due to successful biological control. So we need some good stories here. Um, I think this is my last species. This is burdock. This is again, um, this one has really fallen under the radar. This one I draw to your attention because it's an absolute trap for birds and bats. So, um, and I do know just before someone comes up and says, do you know it's a great liver cleanser? Yes, I do. It's got incredible medicinal values in the root when it's in its first stage of growth. And a lot of these plants have many beneficial or redeeming qualities. I've written articles about them because I think plants are amazing. Um, but it's, again, not indigenous to here. It's invasive. It takes over. It spreads. It becomes a monoculture. It reduces our biodiversity. And it, this species, of all the ones, directly impacts in native species by tr becoming a trap. So it's got these large heart-shaped leaves and it's a two-year plant, it's a biennial. So its first year of growth, it, it looks kind of like rhubarb here, but then it grows tall and then it has these sticky burrs, kind of a purpley flower and then the burrs and then it dries and becomes a trap. And there we go, poor songbird there. Um, there's a, a dead bat that got stuck uh, that was a lactating female, so she she perished as probably did her pup 
that was waiting for her to come back after feeding for the night. Um, and that is a Townsend's long-eared bat. It's a species at risk. So direct impact, directly killing our native species, including species at risk. And then um, burdock is not appreciated by the ranching community. This poor calf, um, you can see it's got chunks of burdock all that have gathered on it, its flank, and then right here its tail is actually stuck to its body. It can't flick its tail. So it's a real problem to, um, to our agricultural, our ranching sector as well. And it's not just about plants. I could talk about all the myriad of different invasive species that we have in, in the Okanagan or British Columbia. I've talked about plants. I'm just going to shift gears for the next couple of slides and talk about the insects because this is what is starting to make the news. I see this as the next big thing. I've touched on it already, um, but here we have, and we've got some samples in, in resin here. You can come look at the table. Um, this is called the brown marmorated stink bug. We do have a lot of native stink bugs. They're supposed to be here. They're meant to be here. The unique feature with this one is this, and you've got to get really good glasses or, <laughs> or a hand lens, and I can relate now to myself too. It's got these white stripes on the antenna. Um, <laughs> you want me to get even more detail? It's got these on its shoulder. It has these little edges. They're little, like, triangle sharp edges. Um, that makes it distinctive from other stink bugs. It's got this shield-shaped body, so it's not the long, skinny body. You know, in the fall, we get what we all, I call them box elder bugs. They're just, and they come to your door. They want to come in. They know winter's coming, but they're long and skinny. These guys are wide, shield-shaped, but it's those white stripes. So they, uh, came to North America in the 1990s. So, if, you know, some of these insects are much newer to coming to North America. Um, so 1990s and 2015, they showed up in the Okanagan Valley. We feared they were coming. What's the concern? Well, they eat over 100 different plant species. Some of their favorites are grapes, apples, peaches, pears, tomatoes, peppers, so y you get the gist. They don't care. It's all tasty. They've got a long feeding tube, and they, they poke and feed, and then they'll go to the next one, and then it just starts to rot there. So huge impact, huge economic impact to our agricultural sector. That's the concern. We haven't seen it yet, but as I say, they are here. They, they occur um, uh, en masse in the Fraser Valley. They're also in the Lower Mainland, Vancouver Island, um, and they're in the Okanagan Valley, and they've actually moved also into um, the Kootenays. They've started showing up there. But the hot spot so far, believe it or not, is downtown Kelowna. They're hitchhikers. They probably came in someone's vehicle or attached themselves to some, some sort of material, and that's what typically happens. They, they start out in the urban core, and then they seek out opportunity um, in agricultural areas. So they have shown up at some orchards in Kelowna, but they haven't seen uh, significant crop losses yet. And so we're hoping we might have dodged a bullet. But guess what their favorite host plant is? This one, and that is tree of heaven, and that is invasive, and we have no shortage. So this is now where we're starting to have the invasive plants be a host for the newly arriving invasive insects. This is a problem. This is a big one. Um, you'll hear more and more in the news about that same preferred host plant, tree of heaven here. This species is not here yet. I do have a sample and resin up at the table. This is called spotted lanternfly. I mentioned it earlier. It's a plant hopper, and it's caused devastating impacts in the United States um, on the eastern, eastern seaboard in Pennsylvania, where it's reduced grape um, crops by up to 90%. 90%, yes. We do not want this here, but if you also look at the map of Tree of Heaven, now it, these, 
these, uh, this lanternfly has started showing up in small numbers on the western side of North America. And that's the same path that the marmorated stink bug took. Um, starts showing up in California, then Oregon, then Washington. And if you again look at that map of Tree of Heaven, it's like the path that we're just pointing the way for the species going, come on up, we're waiting for you. Um, yeah, and it also attacks other species of concern, nut trees and some of the fruit trees. So um, we don't want it. If you think you see it, report it. And this is the last one of the insects that a lot of people get. A, I start getting the calls in March. I'm already getting them. This is the elm seed bug. Um, and the elm seed bug is completely dependent on elm trees and our only native or invasive, sorry, our only elm tree here is the Siberian elm tree, which is on the right hand side. Um, so it's dependent on this tree. It does not impact the agricultural sector, but it will impact you in your house. It will be a nuisance. Yeah, is anybody dealing with this or dealt with it? Okay, yeah, uh, you'd be, I, they probably would have been speaking up already. Oh, I've, they will go into a house by literally the hundreds, if not thousands, and then they poop on windowsills. Um, my, um, uh, bookkeeper in Summerland, they got rid of an elm tree and it disturbed all, all, of, all of the elm seed bugs and they ended up coming through the extractor fan and as she was cooking the stove, they would start falling down into her saucepan. Yeah, yeah, it's that ugh factor. So, yeah, we don't want them. But if we don't have the elm trees, guess what? They can't survive. All right, so I just want to wrap up with what we're doing, what you can do. So I, I got to step back so I can read it to you guys. But um, so the vision of Oasis is to control, prevent, and minimize the impacts of invasive species on our communities, our natural environment, and our economy. So Oasis strives to think globally but act locally. And we encourage people to take action in their own communities, their cities, their towns. Um, the bullets there just speak to some of the purposes that we have. We assess the state of the invasive species. We, we identify new species and potential species. We set priorities and we explore opportunities for cooperative efforts and initiatives. This is all part of what we do and it takes a team. This is uh, the full um, complement of staff we had last year. We're hiring staff again this year. Luckily, we've got a lot coming back from last year. Of course, we've got a board of directors. But Oasis is about partners. These are the staff, but it's about working with so many community partners and people like yourselves. I really, this, I just had to slip this in somewhere. This is a site near Penticton. It's in West Bench. This is up at Max Lake. Many of you might be familiar with it. The left, purple loosestrife in the background in the wetland, Canada thistle. We put insects up there. The photo on the left was taken in 2020. The photo on the right, 2023. When you get the right insect for the right plants in the right place and you cross your fingers and toes and everything. Yeah, just joking, but it just shows, like this is, this, I, I was so excited to be able to witness this and we've been taking school kids up here. Um, now, I'll be honest, there is a little bit of Canada thistle still in here, but the plants are half the size and there's only about 10% left. So we've had youth, middle school kids going up and digging those plants and we've been planting native species. We're, we're working with the regional district, the land conservancy, the Penticton Indian Band, the school kids. It is just such a wonderful story and such a wonderful experience. And this is what keeps me doing what I'm doing. Um, so now it's up to you. What can you do? You want to be aware. Arm yourself with information. When you're out and about, I know many of you are probably ready to start going walking on trails, birding, maybe you camp, maybe you take your grandkids out somewhere. Um, make sure that when you arrive, you've got clean footwear, and when you leave, 
you have clean footwear. We're starting to set up boot brush stations at trailheads where you can actually wipe your shoes, but you can do that at home too. Check your vehicle, watch where you park if you're in a parking area that you don't actually roll your tires right onto a big patch of puncture vine. Um, and stay on the trails. I know we're tempted to go off the trails, but we're really gonna have less things sticking to us or getting stuck in our boots or hounds tongue on our pants if we stay on the trails. Very important messaging. The hashtag is play clean go, which speaks to the like, keep things clean, but go out and have fun. It's also important, I'm sure there's gardeners in the room. And as I mentioned earlier, this is the time of year and, you know, I go there and one of the things that drives me nuts are the wildflower seed packets. And I will say, it's getting better. There are some wildflower seeds out there that truly are native species. They're indigenous. Um, they're native to our area. They will grow well. They've been collected here or not far away, maybe in the interior of the province. But a lot of time, those seed packets that say, you know, hummingbird garden, pollinator garden, they are filled with invasive plants. They're invasive species that are purposely in there, but there's also contaminants. And often those, the really cheap ones, it'll look this gorgeous picture on the front and you're like, oh, I wonder what's in there. And it doesn't list anything. Do not, definitely don't buy those seed packets. So if you have any doubt, give me a call, send me an email and I'll, I'll help guide you. But if you're bringing mulch, soil, um, anything to your property, this is often where people are unknowingly bringing contaminated soil amendments to your property. I've had people up on Anarchist Mountain, so just outside of Asuyas, puncture vine is now up on the mountain because people brought aggregate material, um, and then they expanded their garden, expanded the walkway, and suddenly they're like, what's this plant? Well, it came from the rock that they just brought up. So talk to your source where you're getting this material. Ask them what their practices are for invasive plants, and if they look at you strangely, go somewhere else. You have choices. And make sure you dispose of invasive plants properly. That's another key thing. Again, we just, we don't want to be putting them in the compost. We don't want them putting them in the green bin. We want to be properly disposing of them, getting them to the landfill so that they're buried like household garbage. Um, some of our landfills have special places where they do a deep burial, so you just have to check at your local landfill. But you do not have to pay for it. If you have small amounts, just put it in your garbage can. If you have bigger amounts, you want to take it to the landfill. And again, any questions, we're just a phone call or email away. And report. If you see something unusual, it's your favorite trail and there's this plant you've never seen before. Or maybe it's a common plant, like toad flax, but you're like way out, you know, you're in back country and there's just this one little patch. Um, report it in. Uh, I'd say the best thing, if you're local, which I think all of you are, just contact us. We are your local organization. We can help you out. We'll collect that data and we'll do something about it, whether we're passing the information on or we send a team out to remove it. But get as much information as you can. Record the species. An estimate of this, the area it covers, where is it? Is it, you know, 1.2 kilometers on trail X, turn left at the tree stump, whatever. If you happen to have a GPS or it's built into your phone, record that, just as much info, or put a dot on a map for us. Um, you can also do the Report Invasives BC app. And I know there's iNaturalist and many other ways of reporting, but again, locally, number one, just give us a shout and take good photos. The X's are on here because they aren't good photos. These are real photos people have sent me and said, what is this? And it might look okay, but you zoom in, I can't, like I felt like saying, well, they're ponderosa pine trees, what do you mean? Um, so send me a landscape shot, send me a close-up of the whole plant, don't just you know, bring me a leaf. I've had people do that. What is this? And you know, it's this huge plant. For some reason, they just collected a leaf. Um, and send a high quality image. And, and if you're like, well, it's so big, I have to send three emails. Okay, send me three emails. 
but I want good quality photos and then I can help you identify it. Lots of resources out there. There's our two websites. Um, this is us, Oasis. This is another one for the Okanagan Valley. We pulled together for the agricultural sector called Okanagan Invasive Species Online, and there's everything invasive on there. There's um, close to 80 species of birds, mammals, insects, fish, aquatic plants, terrestrial plants, and so on. Um, so if you're looking to ID something, OISO is your best bet. If it's general information, our website booklets like what we have here today um, available digitally. And the regional district produced this amazing resource a few years ago, and there's a whole chapter on invasive species that I wrote. So this is all about climate change and building resilient communities. It's an amazing resource. It is available digitally. So what I'm meaning is if you have a computer or iPad, you can bring it up on the screen. Um, so go talk to the regional district. They may still have hard copies available. I'm not sure. It's a fantastic resource. Thank you very much. I think I've got about five minutes for questions. Um, there's my email and our website again. Um, I just want to thank Environment and Climate Change Canada for helping to um, fund us, as well as the regional district of Okanagan, Similkameen. And thank you for coming today. Good question. The question was about biological control or biocontrol. So that's using the natural insect enemies that I I referenced several times in my talk. And is there a concern about what happens if, if they do a really good job, I think, and clean everything up? Um, biocontrol is amazing, and it's really about finding a balance. And these insects never eat themselves out of house and home. And if they do, um, they, they are typically good flyers. They self-disperse. They move themselves to the next um, patch of whatever. And there's about eight to 10 years of research, very in-depth research that starts typically in Europe and Switzerland to investigate the species of interest. It's often a um, consortium of scientists from Canada, the United States, and sometimes Mexico that are working together on it because it's very expensive. They want to make sure these insects are host specific, which means the insect for toad flax only eats toad flax, the insect for hound's tongue only eats hound's tongue. Um, there have been some issues over the years with the thistle plants, where sometimes, you know, and they saw this in the States, I don't think it's reported in Canada, where um, there was a bioagent on the invasive thistle plant and it switched and did do some damage to a native thistle. But um, beyond that, there's, um, that's the main thing that the, the 10, eight to 10 years of research takes into account um, to make sure that they are gonna stay on that plant. So. Um, I have seen them, like the hound's tongue, there's a hound's tongue weevil, it often clears out an area where there's just one plant, one plant, and where it was a field. Then you find them, you know, 50 or 100 meters down the road, they've just moved themselves. So there's no concern about moving to um, a crop or native species, typically. The research is done to prevent that. Yeah, so there's a story out there. Now, I would love for everybody to start taking action and removing Tree of Heaven. We got to start somewhere, but we have a big, long-term job ahead of us. People need to be doing it correctly. So um, I think what it speaks to, the point I was having with, with another uh, conversation with someone earlier, is I think what we really, we all need to do our own action. And I've talked about that a lot today. Another thing you can do, talk to your local politicians, local government, talk to your MP, talk to your MLA, especially your MLA. Our legislation in British Columbia, I'll repeat, it's abysmal. I go every year and speak to the Select Standing Committee on Government Finances. They agree, they do a recommendation, and nothing changes. Like, in my career, unfortunately, we, I don't see us having a change to our provincial legislation. But we can, we also have some local legislation that needs some work and the regional district is working on it. Um, at a local government level, city of Penticton has abilities that the regional district doesn't. They follow different legislation. 
Um, I won't get into all of it and bore you right now, but the point is they could strengthen their legislation to make it mandatory for um, certain invasive species to be removed by property owners. Um, it could come under the good neighbor bylaw. Um, right now it's, it's not in there and it's a little bit complicated, but it is possible there are um, local governments in British Columbia who have done that and have banned the sale of invasive plants for their town, for their community. It is possible, but it takes, it takes people to say, I want this, I want this change. So learn more about it and feel free to speak up and I'm still learning about this particular um, situation. But yeah, I'm a strong believer of the carrot and the stick. I think we need to have the legislation um, but we also need to make people aware. Some people just don't know, and when you tell them that's an invasive tree, boom, you know, it's down in a few months, but yeah. So are you talking about, her? she's asked if, if I advise on poison, so um, we do use and support uh, the, the judicial use of herbicide for control of invasive plants. It's one of the tools that is out there. Um, we support uh, use of herbicides that are registered for use, that are approved in Canada to be applied by people who know what they're doing and have all the permits and the knowledge and expertise. Um, it, it, is a t it is one of the tools that we use and, and encourage at the right place. But every situation uh, needs to be looked at individually. There's definitely, when you're near water, when you're near sensitive areas, um, those are definitely pesticide-free zones. Yeah, but none of herbicides are very different from what's impacting our insects and, and the bee community, which I think there's a lot of confusion with the term poison and pesticide and then herbicide. Herbicides are specifically targeting plants. Yes, and uh, so the question was if we have um, Japanese knotweed here. We, we have uh, two species of knotweed in the area called Japanese and Bohemian. They look very similar. Um, Bohemian is a hybrid knotweed species, and these, um, these are very fast-growing perennial plants that a lot of people mistakenly think it's bamboo. It's sometimes called false bamboo, tends to have quite a large heart-shaped leaf, and it looks like a bit of a zigzag pattern in the branching. Um, it dies back in the winter above ground, but it's very much alive, and this time of year it just it starts to grow and has these um, bamboo-like stalks. They're hollow stalks, and they're very cool looking. Like, they're very tropical, but they are very destructive. They're destructive to um, fences and foundations. They'll find weaknesses in your house foundation and show up in your basement, and I'm not joking. I've seen that before. Um, they will take down a fence. It's a very prolific plant in the lower mainland, Fraser Valley, on the island, um, up in the Whistler area. Where we have it here is mainly on private properties. And more often than not, it's somebody that came from the lower mainland and dug up a chunk and <laughs> planted it in their garden. Um, I won't name the community, but there's a local community that I talked to maybe 15 years ago, and it was a garden club, and one lady had moved, and then she split hers up and distributed. Everyone in the garden club now had knotweed, and they and I. So anyway, then I was helping them remove knotweed from all their properties. Very challenging plant to control. It is here, but private properties, so. Other than give advice, um, there's not a lot we are directly doing with it. But did you have anything specific? Just well, curious, my or? Sister has some Real, oh yeah. Yes, yeah. So yeah, it's one that you know don't don't let a friend or neighbor tell you, ah, I got this great bamboo. Look at it looks great. You know, people use it instead of a fence, like a natural barrier for with the neighboring property, but. Um, yeah, it's um, it actually it's the first plant that I directly was involved with. A, a fellow called me up about five years ago. He was looking at buying a, a vest investment property in Penticton, and literally the paperwork was there. He just had to sign. He went for one more look, and he saw these little sprouts growing. And he's from the Lower Mainland, and he sent me pictures. He said, "This is this is not weed, isn't it?" I go, "Yep." And he ripped up the papers. He did not buy that property, so. 
it caused um, a sale of a property not to go through. He said, I want to invest and make money. That's going to cost me thousands. Thousands, because he could see it started on his property or potential and was going to the neighbors, and he knew it was going to impact his pocketbook. So, yeah, it's kind of cool to tell that story now. So, it's yeah, it's not, not one you want. So, thank you, everyone. I'm cognizant it's five after, so thanks for coming.